Hello everyone, welcome. This is the first edition of our X-Ray Talks. Let's kick things off. Um, in a second, I'm going to introduce you to our Chief Market Analyst, Neil Wilson. If you've got any questions, please do drop them uh, in the chat and we'll uh, make sure that we get around to those. Obviously, it's uh, been a pretty tumultuous start to the year. It's a bit of an understatement. We've seen markets make headlines, unprecedented moves both directions. Data's been smashing records. Central banks, governments across the world have unleashed huge stimulus and uh, slammed the handbrakes on their own economies. So um, let's bring Neil in now. Neil, uh, markets are doing a lot better than they were at the height of the March sell-offs. Um, there are some sensitive signs of a recovery from the data, but what's your impression of where things really stand at the moment? Yeah, I mean, it's, um, it's, been, it's been an amazing few months. Um, and um, this is, um, these sort of events like, like we're, we're doing now are, are sort of indicative of really the way, the way things have, have altered over the last sort of few months. You know, um, in days gone by, just, if, you know, last year we were, we were out in Dubai doing, you know, in-person seminars for three days straight. And, and those sort of events are, are not possible now. So um, we were sort of getting more and more used to this, this kind of um, format and, uh, and, and speaking, you know, speaking to people and family on, on, on Zoom and so on. So I think that the first thing is, is really the change that's happened sort of in the real world. Um, we have seen this massive, obviously this massive um, gap in the market where, um, throughout February and March, we saw we saw a significant sell off, one of the, the steepest declines we've ever seen. Um, but that has been that has been um, countered lately with this massive rebound. Um, and so we are, I think, you know, where we're at at the moment is is a bit of a tipping point. You know, do we do we get um, the sort of recovery, that V shaped recovery that um, that a lot of people have been talking about um, and hoping for? Um, and is that um, that's the first thing I think probably that, that is sort of on the minds of, of, you know, people in the market. Second thing would be, um, does that even matter? Um, should the, the, the central banks and the policymakers continue to deliver the, the sort of stimulus that, um, that, that they've been delivering? And um, I think to an extent, you, you, you do see this slight disconnect between the real economy and, and, and what's going on in the market. Um, the S&P um, has sort of effectively um, wiped out its um, its uh, its losses for the year. It's 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 doing uh, remarkably well. The Nasdaq's um, up. Um, European markets have have, have underperformed. Um, partly that's with lack of growth um, stocks that exist in the European space. Um, those technology names that we've seen do very well out of out of the the pandemic um have have really predominantly been in the us you know they're, they're heavily weighted to the us and the us market is heavily weighted to these sort of tech stocks so that's that explains part of that sort of um outperformance um i think um you know like i say it's a tipping point at the moment i think we're, we're dealing with this combination of uh, factors do we get a v-shaped recovery how quick is the recovery um what to what extent does stimulus kick in um and and Markets at the moment do look quite quite expensive. Um, earnings earnings expectations have come down significantly, but in a sense, if you look at the S and P um, as as our sort of benchmark index, really, then you know earnings expectations are based on, a lot on on a on a sort of unknown quantity. Um, so we could well see um, earnings expectations increase. We could see earnings forecasts for uh, these sort of bottom up forecasts that we see um, for uh, S and P 500 companies actually um, improve over the coming months. Um, the 2021 forecasts, um, and then and then putting that to one side, we've actually got as the most amount of cash sitting on the sidelines as, as we've ever had um, in the market. So um, there's a huge amount of cash sitting there idle, looking for somewhere to go. Um, there are um, there are expectations that earnings should only get better from here. Um, so I think actually, you know, despite the S and P trading at twenty three times forward earnings, what you might see is this increase in the in in, in this improvement in the earnings expectations that actually drives um, that that could actually drive the market um, to to new highs, despite all the problems that we're seeing uh, relating to uh, to the pandemic. I mean, but to what, to what level is that sustainable? Because I mean, we were talking about stocks being overvalued even before all this kind of kicked off. So, um, you know, and a lot of that is kind of fueled by stimulus, isn't it? And a lot of that stimulus is temporary. 
we've got things like the you know the ECB you know pandemic emergency purchase program you know a lot of fiscal stimulus as well that's temporary it's governments um you know like the Australia job keeper scheme we've got you know in the UK we're paying furloughed workers until September October what happens to markets if that when that stimulus comes to an end well I think I think what what we've seen over the last 10 years is that it's it's not possible for um policymakers for central banks to remove stimulus um, as soon as the Fed tried to embark on quantitative tightening it, it, it caused problems uh, we've seen taper tantrums before I think you know the, the and the pandemic gives them an excuse not to not to not to do anything but supply more stimulus so I think that there's you know the saying don't fight the Fed is, is very apt and they they are continuing to support the market and as long as they do so then then the market is is kind of heading in one direction there might be pullbacks there might be um drawdowns and i think i think we may well see um a pullback again um i think we saw you know the s&p i keep going back to the s&p 500 because it's the main market that that i look at um as it's the best sort of broad gauge of what's going on in the u.s um we sort of test that 26, uh, 29, 36 level um, in the in the um, uh, in the last day or two, and that that was a big Fibonacci level. You know, if you're if you're into your technical trading that kind of thing, um, then you know that Fibonacci level um, is really important. So we saw that 29, 36 level touched on the. Um, uh, on in the last day to the big Fibonacci level, it was the 61.8% retracement, 100-day moving average. That level was really important, and it and it did offer a big, big support. Um, and uh, there's there's real sort of um, there's real sense that we can we can test these levels again, and then we can then we can um, then we can move you know move forward. Um, but I think we could we could be testing sort of 2800 on the S and P 500. Before we get that sort of fresh leg higher, I think um, you know twenty eight hundred would be um, a level at which I, I, I think that there's a lot of buyers coming in at that level. Um, but I think you need to see some of the retail traders that have driven up the market. And this going back to the other point, you've seen retail traders really drive this market. You've not seen institutional funds coming in massively. Um, and the, you know there's been all this chat about the Robin Hood traders in the U.S. are spending the stimulus checks on. On um, on on buying stocks, um, and it's a really um, you know it's a really interesting trend to see retail really driving this market. Institutional funds sitting on the sidelines with a huge amount of cash, they'll want to see a bit of a pullback again before they re-enter. Now they they got it wrong essentially, um, but they will they will try and uh, and move this forward um, once um, I think I think we finally got rid of the child. Um, one once. Um, you know, once we get a bit of once we get a bit of a pullback, again, uh, it's a good re-entry point, I think, for for the market, um, and I think we will see that that move forward as long as the stimulus keeps coming and as long as we don't get the kind of mass lockdown. Um, and that sort of jumping around a bit here, but in terms of the the lockdown, that, that that's what causes economic damage. It's the lockdowns that cause economic damage, not the pandemic itself. Um, and as long as the next time around, if there's another wave of cases, and we are seeing signs of problems in Beijing and Texas and Florida, the key is we're much better equipped now than we were in the past um, to avoid to avoid the lockdown. So you can target uh, specific locations. Maybe you um, you you keep the economy moving more freely, um, and we also have um, sort of better treatment. The, the doctors know how to treat people a lot better than they did before. Um, we've seen the steroid drug just yesterday announced as a as a as a significant step forward. So there's a lot of improvements um, uh, happening uh, around the fringes, and, and even a vaccine that AstraZeneca is working on, uh, which should be due by October. Um, a lot of things happening that mean that the next sort of wave of cases, should there be be that, won't be anything like as bad. Um, and I think that that gives the market sort of the hope that that. Uh, it can keep moving higher as long as things don't get worse it will keep moving higher as long as the stimulus uh, again it's all, always comes back to the fed as long as that stimulus comes back um from the fed yeah uh, but is there kind of a, a bit of a talking about lockdowns for example is there a bit of a risk that there is longer term damage that's been dealt to the economy that is not yet being considered like it's it's all very well to say that we're you know there's kind of good to be this v-shaped recovery and stuff but this is going to hit a lot of companies 
um, you know, in and even when we do reopen, a lot of companies aren't going to be able to function the same way that they did. A lot of them are having to take on a lot more debt to survive, you know, get rid of workers, etc. like that. Is, is there a risk that actually when we talk about reopening the economy as a whole, we're actually, there's some very sort of deep weaknesses in there that perhaps are being overlooked currently? Yeah, I, for sure. I, I'm not sure they're, they're necessarily overlooked. I think I think the the, the panic selling that we saw in, in March expressed that fear, mm. um, and I think you still see certain sectors um, really struggling. And I, I'm, we keep seeing big, big daily price gains for the likes of um, you know the Carnival Cruises, Tui, that sort of thing. But they're moving all over the place because um, mm. they're these these are companies that will be affected in in the long term i don't think there's any doubt that the, there'll be long-term implications and a longer term productivity loss as we retool the economy i think um you know this kind of retooling of the economy has not been done before uh, at any time since the second world war when you have a mass um, you know exit from the war the war uh, economy to a peacetime economy uh, and that's really the the sort of um, the sort of move that that we're seeing. So there will be a loss in productivity, like we saw at the end of the Second World War, and then uh, and then a, a gradual recovery, and there will be a permanent damage done. But I think for a trader, you know, that that doesn't mean that stock that, that the stock market is going to necessarily reflect that. It just maybe means that certain stocks. You know, you maybe if you're um, a buy and hold investor um, or you, you are day trading uh, individual stocks, then then you know. Clearly, there's certain stocks that are, are going to be affected in the long run, um, and clearly they're in a negative way. And clearly, there are those which should uh, benefit from the new environment. And you know, we have seen these sort of these stocks where the initial wave, the initial wave of the recovery was based around these stocks, like you know, Moderna working on a vaccine or Zoom that we're using right now, um, those sort of stocks. And then the second wave of the recovery was uh, on the hopes of reopening, and that's so that's the the, the cruise operation and the, the holiday maker the holiday companies and the airlines um, and then now we're sort of at this pause sort of moment where we're not quite sure whether um, what's going to drive the next leg higher um, so I think yeah there's going to be some permanent damage but it doesn't mean that the stock market um, will will be permanently impaired I think you know you, you've already seen like I say the Nasdaq hitting record at all-time highs in the last sort of week or so um, and uh, you know Stocks will stocks will inflate as long as the central bank um, support is there, and and that's I think again and again we come back to that, but that is really what's what's driving this market higher. Okay, so uh, as we're back on the, the topic of uh, stimulus, let's talk uh, negative interest rates for a bit. It's quite a controversial topic. We're hearing about them quite a lot. They've already been implemented um, before this happened in in certain places, you know, Japan and. European Central Bank, etc. We've had recently, we had the Bank of England governor, Andrew Bailey, kind of did a bit of a U-turn. He'd gone from saying, no, we're definitely not going to have them to we can't rule it out. Uh, in, the, in the States, Powell is very, very against them, but Trump is very, very in favour of them. Um, you know, how much worse do things need to get before you could have even Powell saying, okay, maybe it's on the cards? And, you know, what, what are the real, why is it such a controversial policy? Um, well, I mean, I think there, there's a real, there is a real chance of, of negative interest rates, although in, I think in, in the UK and the US there's a sort of slight dogma that, that's against them, and I think for good reason, they, they, you know, they, they cause um, real damage to the banking sector, and you need a healthy banking sector for, um, in order to lend uh, to, to, um, to corporates. Um, without a healthy banking sector, um, you see in Europe what you do is you have a, a you know, a long-term uh, productivity problem, uh, structural problems in Europe, which can be sort of can be can be if you can look at it, you can pair it back to the to the 08 crisis and and the fact that Europe never sorted its banks out, it never got the banks productive again. Um, it should have cleared out more of the bad debt quicker. It should have allowed more banks to fail. Um, the US didn't do that. US was much more aggressive, got its house in order much, much quicker. So they're in much better shape to, to lend to, to, um, to corporates and to, to smaller businesses as well. So I think um, negative interest rates hamper, uh, hamper bank pro profitability. That in turn actually hampers um, lending. I think it, it, you know, the transmission effect is not very good once you hit negative rates. Um, and it, I don't think it's a constructive thing uh, and just you know as a sort of 
logical point. It, it, it doesn't make much sense, really. Um, I think for the for the pound, if you're looking at trade, if you are trading the pound, for example, what you've got at the moment are, are a series of risks around the prospect of negative rates, the a Brexit with no deal. Um, you've got uh, the pandemic and the fact that the UK economy seems to be um, significantly uh, more more affected than than any other rich nation, uh, according to the OECD forecasts for this year. Um, and then you've got this twin deficit um, problems, so current account deficit and and spending deficit. So I think there's a real there is a real risk for the pound at the moment. Um, that, that might might already be factored in at one twenty five or there or thereabouts against the dollar that might already be fully priced um but there are i, I feel perhaps not and i think again with the pound you could see um certainly on the headline risk um around brexit talks and by headline risk what we mean is sort of when the headlines flash across the the news wires you see a significant move in any in any direction uh, because because traders and algos are moving just on these headlines um there's a significant headline risk uh, around Brexit talks right now because they, they don't seem to be that constructive. Um, and then you bake in all these other factors like negative interest rates, then that is a, that is a concern. I think the US probably, I don't see them going for that. I think, you know, j sort of said, maybe it's, it's a, we never discount anything, but um, I, th I think um, negative interest rates won't be the way that the Fed goes. I think they've got, um, they've got other tools. I think they might look at, controlling the yield curve and that might be a more appropriate tool for them. Is that going to have a, a sort of a dampening effect on the US dollar if you keep the keep a lid on those rates? I think um, I mean related to the pandemic we saw a massive surge in the dollar um, on, primarily on a sort of squeeze there was a shortage of US dollars um, that uh, that existed as, as people were scrambling for cash they're scrambling to raise cash and we've seen that unwind and um, so we're back to sort of close to where we were before I think longer term you know the dollar is always um, the dollar people are always calling the top and the dollar um, and I and I'm consistently um, against that idea I think that, that you know you, you do see movement obviously it moves around but I, I think um, the dollar can still have room to, to move higher from here Okay, cool. Um, whilst we're on the topic of FX, let's talk about, has there been a bit of a disconnect recently with the way that um, FX markets are responding to stimulus? Because we've had, kind of recently, we've had headlines about the euro, for example, being supported by more stimulus from the ECB, which would kind of traditionally have a downside impact. Is, is that kind of a, a thing that's limited to the euro? Is it a bit of a wider disconnect? Or do you think it was a bit of a kind of sort of transient blip? No, I think it's just that because there's such mass central bank intervention, it's uh, everyone's sort of operating on the same level. So there's no, you know, there's no yield anywhere. So uh, it doesn't really matter if you inject more stimulus. It's not really dovish in any real meaningful sense. It doesn't really weigh on the currency um, because everyone's raced, everyone's on the floor already. Um, and this mass, mass central bank intervention is, I mean, for the whole of last year, it killed, um, as central banks came back into the market last year, it killed the FX volatility. And I think, again, you, you are, you know, the major pair, except for that dollar squeeze that we saw, the major pairs are quite, quite rangy, quite range bound. Um, and I think really things have flipped because of the pandemic. That, that has sort of flipped to the point where now stimulus is seen as a positive um, for the economy. So any kind of uh, excess bond buying, and fiscal stimulus is seen as a positive because it's it's um, it's actually getting the economy moving quicker. Um, and uh, you know we go into sort of modern monetary theory and the fact that you know you you, you can you're never going to default. You can keep printing the money um, and that side of things. But I think you know the the central banks are all are, are acting sort of in unison. They're sort of doing basically the same thing, and therefore it doesn't have a material impact on on the currency at the moment. The the thing will be in as we come out of it in twenty twenty one twenty twenty two. Um, to what extent any um, sort of increase in the money supply that we're seeing uh, leads to a kind of inflation and where the inflation hits. So does do we get um, a sort of uh, a period of stagflation, um, a period of um, high inflation, low growth, that would be the, the risk. And if you see that happening in one particular currency sort of location, then then that could cause a real problem for, for individual currencies. But I think um, 
you know at the moment we're we're kind of all 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 on a sort of equal footing as it were yeah and i mean as a, i mean the market yeah, as you say it is kind of quite flat at the moment um lots of range band trading but um so are there are there still opportunities in the fx market and where should you look for those yeah i think um I think again, you know, you look at pounds as being a real um, the implied volatility out to sort of three months now for the euro and the pound has actually increased quite a lot. Um, so there, there are, I think there are opportunities there. Um, you know, you look at that as I say, looking at the headline risk around the pound, around the Brexit risk. Um, you know, should we get a deal on Brexit that's sort of positive? And you, you know, you look at the UK being a more competitive space than than Europe um, outside of Brexit. Uh, or beyond after Brexit, sorry, um, then you know the, there's room, there's room for the pound to really recover to more sort of historic levels. I think um, once you clear, once you clear away some of the risk, and that's the sort of the point I'm making that a lot of the risk is maybe factored into the currency at the moment. So twin deficit risks, uh, negative interest rate risks, um, Brexit risks. Once you sort of move out of those risks then actually the pound probably has a has a decent um upside potential um but it's maybe not right now and it's maybe not going to happen for a while um and we could retest the lows again um should there be um you know a problem with the brexit talks and, and sort of deterioration there um i think as well you'd be looking at maybe the sort of uh, commodity currencies um potentially on a rebound in commodity prices uh, copper uh, starting to look quite bullish. Oil has recovered really, really well. Um, and I think you could see all demand pick up more than the market had been pricing over the last couple of months. So if oil, the, the IEA, the Paris-based um, International Energy Agency, yesterday it raised its forecast oil demand um, for the year. I think you maybe get, and again, even if there's a second wave, you won't see the same kind of lockdown. Uh, happening and therefore oil demand could pick up a bit more than expected. OPEC cuts are already producing an impact. Um, BP's cut shale rigs down to I think one or two. Um, it's we're seeing production coming off and um, supply uh, and, and demand coming back. Uh, so for currencies, you know the Canadian dollar, the Aussie, Kiwi potentially, um, they could be of interest just because of this potential recovery in 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 commodity prices um as as um as global growth starts to to rebound um and we, and what you will see of course are these really impressive sort of month we've already seen it yesterday with the u.s retail sales number massive month for month change that helps um improve sentiment so um i think i think you could see could see some 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 interest in those currencies but let, let's talk about oil a bit more now whilst we're uh, waiting to see if we get any questions in. So um, OPEC historic level of production cuts currently, those are going to run out in July. They've said they don't, they, so, so far they've said they don't really have any interest in extending that level. But that, the forecast you mentioned, I think also said that we're not looking at getting oil demand back to pre-crisis levels until until 2021 or 2022. So how can OPEC go back to pre-crisis levels of production cuts? when demand's not going to go back to pre-crisis levels for another year or two? Well, I think, um, I think actually, you know, demand might, de, de, 2019 demand might already be the peak. I, I, I think, um, you know, we might, uh, Bernard Linney BP actually talked about, we maybe already hit peak oil. Um, and if you look at the US, peak oil, all demand's been falling for years in the US, despite the economy growing by 50% um, in the last uh, sort of two decades. Um, the, so there's a structural shift happening with electric vehicles and, and green energy and, and things like that. And interestingly, looking at the US election coming up this year, Joe Biden, big player for green energy. So we could see, again, further structural shift happening there um, around green energy. And again, what that means for, for oil demand. But um, I think, you know, shorter term, we do see oil demand picking up. Um, OPEC cuts. Um, OPEC cuts are are scheduled to last two years. So, although the the top level, the maximum cuts that they that they've got going at the moment, which is nine point seven million barrels per day, plus extra voluntary cuts by Saudi Arabia and others, which take it to around eleven million barrels per day. The, you are still going to have cut. They are still going to um, low, have lower production for two full years. Um, so it's tapering down um, and that that helps 
you know that that helps to stop the oversupply um uh sort of festering for too long and i think you know we're looking at you know the oil market being pretty well rebalanced within the next few months so um that that um that should support pricing i think you know um the problem the problem would be sh your shale production coming back online maybe a bit a bit quicker and what that means um for for the supply coming back on but i think i think broadly you know i think you're looking at more constructive environment for oil than um than some of the headlines have suggested and uh, as uh, you know when we we're looking at negative oil prices in uh, a few few weeks ago um you know we were really worried that that we were in this sort of period of max you know the, the the storage capacity being full for months um and that that what that would do to pricing longer term and the damage that it would do um but i think i think we've come back a lot quicker than than had been feared and i think we still see some some decent demand um i mean short term pricing looking at the charts i'm not i'm not sure that you don't get a retest of 25 dollars in wti but i'm you know over the next few months i, I think we see a more constructive outlook cool um, you mentioned the shift to green energy. I'll just talk about that for a minute. Do you think that, that that kind of structural change has been helped or hindered by the pandemic? Is this a good, uh, you know, is this a good time for people to be? Because uh, we've seen um, a lot of, I think, shipping companies have, um, have sort of put pause on some measures to become more sustainable and stuff in terms of uh, transportation and things. Um, I, you know, are we looking at people, um, I mean, Tesla, of course, is doing very well at the moment in the stock um, wise, but it, that structural shift is that going to be in is this a good time now that things have, have kind of hit this level we've had to pause is it a good time to restart doing something new or is it better to put those kind of reforms on hold do you think well uh, and get back to normal before you then undergo those changes yeah i mean i think sort of short and long term is you know it's going to be tougher for big oil to uh, to become green BP wants to be emissions free by 2050, whether that's ever possible or not. But it takes it takes oil. You know, they need the cash flow from the oil to help pay for the infrastructure changes that they need to make. Um, but I think, but I think actually, yeah, the pandemic does accelerate the change. You know, I think we're we're seeing a reset of expectations. If you look at the European level, um, you know, a lot of the the sort of stimulus is 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 going to come um, through and it's going to support green energy. It's not they're not they're not um looking backwards i think i think broadly policymakers are looking um to support green energy um and i think you look at joe biden in the us i mean and he's got opened up a 13 point lead i think on trump uh, today um democrats looking like they, they might be quite good for a, a clean sweep this year if that happens then um then you do see a big big shift in in the in the space in the us which obviously has been maybe been a bit slow versus europe um, to pick up on that, so I think I think you do see an acceleration um, in in the green space. Um, I think we've uh, we were looking at actually a sort of mix of product, a mix of stocks, um, which I can I can send to anyone that's interested. Um, I think it was Goldman Sachs who put together a list um, of stocks that might benefit from the European clean energy push that's happening. Um, so that you know there are those definite definite shifts happening um that is being accelerated by the pandemic yeah okay cool uh, we've got a question from me in here it says um it was mentioned the s p 500 was a sort of litmus for overall trading does the nasdaq hold true and will it continue climbing um i'm not trading yet but trying to get a broad picture of stimulus okay cool yeah thanks Ian. um yeah, I think so. The S and P is is uh, for me is it's you know it's the the broad index of, of large cap U S stocks. So it's, it's the best sort of um, gauge of, of the U S equity uh, market. Um, the Nasdaq is is obviously the the tech stocks. Uh, they've been the ones that have driven the market higher over over the last sort of decade. Um, so the Nas the Nasdaq is is record highs and the S and P not quite. Um, I think the the Nasdaq. It's just it's chock full of these names like Tesla, Netflix, Amazon, Apple. These are the these are like new these are like utilities. These are like bond proxies now. They are they are I think however expensive they look, they are they are sort of like I say I think people buy, are buying them and holding them. They're not. And you know they're not necessarily trading them. They're they're keeping them because these are stocks that that ride out anything 
Um, I mean, Tesla, okay, it's very overvalued based on past price to earnings multiples, trailing price to earnings multiples, but, and even on a forward basis, it's looking quite pricey. But if there's one car company that, that you think is going to exist in 30 years, I would say it's Tesla. So if there's one internet retailer, if there's or the one retailer even that's going to exist in 30 years, it's going to be Amazon. Um, and so these are sort of really high, high quality, uh, very secure. Um, I mean, not the stock could go down 20% tomorrow if, if there's a, if the EU decide or the, the, the U S administration decides to break up Amazon say, but you know, these sort of tail risks aside, uh, these are, these are the sort of secure, relatively secure and all, all investings of course carries risk and, you know, um, markets move up and down, but, um, the, these sort of stocks are the high quality ones that, that are, um, I think perceived as being safer. Um, and therefore I think with their, waiting in in the nasdaq they're waiting in the s p then they're, they're they're pretty good pretty good um you know still got a good outlook for those stocks um and i think that's that um and then you park them to one side and you've got in the nasdaq you've also got these um sort of up and coming kind of disruptors which are going to be the next amazons the next um, the next uh, uh, apples and so on. So I think I think the Nasdaq is always going to be an attractive um, an attractive space to be in. Speaking of up and coming stocks, we talk a bit about the uh, the IPO market at the moment. That's um, yep. so kind of uh, awakened, reawakened quite dramatically recently. Um, we've also seen in uh, Hong Kong as well. They've had a, they've had a pretty good uh, good run recently. Um, companies going public now are they are they maybe sort of slightly benefiting from as you say there's lots of cash on the sidelines and maybe pickings are a bit slimmer so they're enjoying more demand than than they maybe otherwise would um, and do you think that's going to encourage a lot of other companies to try and go public as quickly as they can to sort of tap into that market quickly while there's still that sort of you know huge yeah. appetite yeah I think it's a good time for IPOs because like you've had a big drawdown so a lot of cash has come out investors have taken profits it, they're sitting on cash they want to put they want to find something else to put their cash to work in so they're not seeing great opportunities in airlines not seeing great opportunities in um in whatever else so um maybe they see amazon tesla as being maybe on the you know achieve their price targets already um so where you're looking is you're looking at where the, where the private companies are be doing well we've seen private companies really um doing a lot a lot better really um than a lot of a lot of public companies so i think um with the the drawdown in in the stock market and the cash sitting on the sidelines and also the hunt for yield you know bond bond yields are, are very very low interest rates are are, are are zero um so you're getting nothing from parking your money in 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 safe havens so ipos are looking good and i think there's there's a lot of investor appetite and if you look, you contrast it with the peak. So the peak in the market, which obviously was sort of February 2020, but throughout 2019, we really we were really in a frothy kind of market, um, and that that's where we saw a lot of IPOs not doing so well because it was too frothy. Signs of excess, signs of excess exuberance. Now what we've got is actually a lot of investor. Um, it's actually quite pessimistic, and that because it's pessimistic it's actually quite a good time for, for these things to happen so i think um uh, uh yeah i i think and i think we'll see more i think um jd.com is is coming up for in hong kong uh, the secondary listing in hong kong um we've had zoom info uh jd pete um warner music um so we are looking at maybe some some of the um there's some big sort of stocks that might decide to IPO this year like Palantir which is Peter Thiel's um, the PayPal founder um, his company which um, has lots of contracts with the US uh, defense uh, defense sector um, maybe even Robinhood which is this company which has um, taken the US equity trading market by storm um, these sort of companies I think could be yeah they could be looking at uh, an IPO maybe maybe accelerating um, uh, their their plans for an IPO take advantage of, of sort of you know going we're on it we're on the upturn now so I think um, I think that's 
that's maybe what we're going to see over the, over the next few months. Um, let's go, should we go back to the US election for a bit? We've, we've covered it briefly, but um, obviously sure. so many different factors to unpack there, aren't there? Um, to what, I mean, have we seen a reaction to that, to that Biden lead? Have we seen stocks reacting to that? Or is it quite hard to tell at the moment with so many different things going on, what's, you know, what kind of impact is having at the moment? Yeah, I would say we've probably not seen a reaction in the sense that the stocks are, are still looking quite positive. You know, we've seen this rebound as, in the last few days. There was that, yet last week was a negative week um, and we are seeing a bounce back. So um, I think I think the stocks, stock markets won't particularly like a, a Biden win if it comes also without Democrat clean sweep because um, I think one of the key things we're looking at is potential reform of the Donald Trump tax cuts. Um, that could knock uh, earnings per share by 12% on the S&P 500, according to Goldman Sachs uh, research. Um, and the number of companies which are much more exposed than others, um, uh, like Boeing, for example. Um, so I think we, we could see a reaction, but at the moment we're not seeing that really being priced. I think as we, you know, we're still still sort of exiting the pandemic and exiting and, and dealing with fed stimulus i think as we approach the election a bit a bit closer to the election and the polling really starts to to look in one direction and we could see a, re a reaction um but you also have to balance that counter that with uh the fact that even if the polling suggests biden's you know a democrat clean sweep which should, should technically be negative for stocks then uh you have to price in the the the, the weight what weight do you attach to the fact that Donald Trump might still win? And then also, even if Biden is sort of all else being equal negative for stocks, that, that's not the only factor. There's so many other factors for the stock market that, that, that are at work. So I think um, you could see some 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 uh, some de-risking around certain stocks that are that are, might be exposed to, say, um, um, tax reform. Um, potentially gun control. Uh, that's not not an area I know. I, I, we we don't follow those stocks, but I think that, you know that could potentially be an area. And, so, and, and then clean energy. A lot of the U.S. clean energy stocks could could benefit should should uh, Biden win. Um, and uh, so there there are a few areas to look at. Um, I don't think it, it's not very clear cut. Those it's not not like you can just say, well, this is going to happen and this is going to happen. Um, it's quite a quite a complex sort of um, mix of, of factors all at work. I mean, it would be a busy enough year anyway, wouldn't it? Just if we didn't have all this to think about, you know, it's it's not exactly like we needed all this on top of uh, top of U.S. election, is it? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Busy yeah well yeah exactly but, um we thought that we thought the december uk election was was quite hectic but uh <laughs> that's gonna seem like a holiday isn't it compared to uh compared to what goes on in the us neil is there anything that you've noticed particularly today that's worth highlighting uh not not especially i, I just i think there's obviously this situation in in between india and china which needs monitoring um at the moment it's not producing a significant uh, impact on on risk assets um i think uh what we have seen is that um germany is is a you know sorry i'm jumping here but germany's approved um uh, more stimulant more more spending budget uh spending that's going to be good for the eurozone um but i think that there are certainly as well as the pandemic there are geopolitical risks probably bubbling which um i'd be concerned about um i think the pandemic is is a is a sort of catalyst for change um and that 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 has positives but it also will have some uh, significant downside risks for certain uh, geographies certain asset classes and so on so um you know we need to wait and see i think post pandemic uh, and the sort of post covid world is going to be maybe not as different as as we thought a couple of months ago um but certainly it will be different and uh, there will be some changes happening, so you need to keep your eyes open. Great, cool. Well, um, I think we'll leave it there for now. Neil, thank you very much for um, all thank of you. your wisdom, as always. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. And like we say, if you do have any questions at all, you can get in touch. Um, and there's also, we've got, our, we've got our blog, we've got X-Ray in the platform. There's so much more analysis, so much more content out there to help you get on top of what's going on in the market. So, and, if, uh, and just to add, sorry, Ren, um, you know, um, 
if if you can't think of anything right now, then we're always available. Um, do feel free to drop um, to drop us a line. Um, you can email me or direct. It's in the and I'll and I'll do my best to answer uh, to the best of my ability. Um, if you're looking for for research on a particular market, then that's something that we can that we can do as well. So so do you know we we try and be sort of as as available as possible, and that's sort of the idea behind these. And I think we've got some of our other experts are are, are going to be are going to be carrying out these as well. So if you're interested in, uh, we've got Helen Thomas who's um, uh, from Blonde Money. She's the uh, ex advisor to George George Osborne when he was Chancellor. Um, and she has a sort of polit geopolitical macroeconomic consultancy and she, she does a lot of um, good content that, that we share with, with clients. So um, if, if you're interested in that, she'll be doing one hopefully in the next few weeks. We've got Andrew Barnett, who's a trading, uh, a trading coach from Australia. He's going to be doing one as well. Um, and, and we should have um, uh, Phil Carr, who's, who's, who's one of our um, uh, most popular um, analysts. He's, he's um, head of trading at the gold and silver club and he does a weekly sort of gold oil and silver forecast for us um and he, we'll, we'll be trying to get him to to do one of these in the, in the coming weeks as well so we'll let you know let you know about those um uh, when 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 they're going to happen so um yeah um if, if you're interested in those and do drop us a line thanks again for joining us keep an eye out for uh, we'll be for the next one that we run and um hopefully we'll see you all soon